Good evening and welcome to The Square. Tonight is Viewers Edition 23. It's the 23rd edition where we, the resident panelists of The Square, tackle topics that the public has put to us. Uh, so during the last two, three days, uh, these are topics that we selected to discuss tonight based on our social media feed and what um, uh, you know the public uh, viewers of The Square Rwanda had to say. So amongst the topics we're going to tackle, we're going to take on today, include uh, Rwanda's foreign policy as seen with its recent military deployments on the African continent, we're also going to look at wasteful um, public expenditure. And last but not least, we're also going to look at um, the historic preservation of infrastructure around the city of Kigali. Uh, it's also another topic that was put forward by one of our viewers. My name is Dan Mpisi, host of The Square. Uh, as always, I'm happy to host viewers' edition with The Square and Palace, so we just get to talk, no guests, uh, and, you know, tackle issues that you, the viewers, have put forward to us. Uh, on my right, I'm happy to welcome Charles Haber, resident panelist of The Square. Charles, great to have you on the show. Send me on the send me on Dan Howie. Two things. Uh, apologies to our viewers. I'm not wearing Uzi <laughs> today. Random. That's Have number one. Yeah. <laughs> but number two, I like the hair. Do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bernard Namata, resident panelist on the square. Great to have you on the show as always. Thank Have you seen her I dress? I love the hair too. I know. I love the hair. Thank you. I like the dress. Um, yeah. You. Like so, we always do every last Wednesday of the month. We are here on Viewers Edition, and we'll kick off uh, with the first topic, which is Rwanda's foreign diplomacy, uh, as seen with its uh, recent uh, military deployments across um, different parts of, of the continent. And please keep the conversation going. We'll read out your tweets later on in the show uh, using hashtag the square RW. Um, so as we know, uh, Charlton, uh, Charlton Berner, um, you know, to di diversify uh, Rwanda's uh, economy and increase its self-sufficiency, um, the country has been mobilizing its main assets. Uh, these include military professionalism, political stability, and brand Rwanda. Uh, this is to benefit uh, its foreign policy. Uh, we saw the military deployments in Central African Republic, uh, as well as just recently uh, this year in uh, Mozambique, in Cabo uh, Delgado. Uh, and they've been viewed as military diplomacy supporting economic uh, ambition that nurtures Rwanda's soft power. So my question to you, Bernard and Charles, is, um, you know, what do you take on Rwanda's um, foreign policy as seen with its, you know, largely uh, through its military deployment um, in countries across the African continent? And Charles, I'll, I'll kick off with you. Um, well, uh, a few things. First of all, before I go to the military side of things, I think... Um, Rwanda is very unique. Some of the things that uh, we've gotten away with are unprecedented. Uh, whoever thought that you could kick out the French and, the, and a few years later two of their presidents visit you, uh, a past president visits you, their companies open up shop, uh, reopen up shop, you raise down their, their French culture center, uh, and, and life still goes on. Who and, and the French Cultural Centre is rebuilt. And it is rebuilt. It is Thank rebuilt you so by much. The French, yes. Thank you so much. So, so we say, okay, fine. The way you think we should deal with you is not the way we deal with you. And then, yeah. But who also ever thought that um, that would also tell all our neighbours that you are going to deal with us in the terms under the terms in which we want you to deal with us uh, for a very long time? Uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, Bana and Diana's friends and families was was surviving on friends, I mean on on food and entertainment from from certain neighboring countries that was dropped. Not not to to say that I am guilty or innocent of that, right? Uh, and you still remain a, a strong force. But even fast forward, who would ever who would ever have thought that just a few years after getting out of a, a mayhem and being written off uh, as, as, a, as a failed state that um, the United Nations would keep running to Kigali each time they have a problem anywhere, anywhere on the continent. Uh, and even when the United Nations is not ready to run to Kigali for, for crying for help, uh, individual presidents would do that. So um, the, 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 there is a lot. There is a lot. There is a lot to be applauded, um, and um, well, it should not be taken for granted. It should not be taken for granted. Of course, uh, we live in a very financially demanding world. Uh, 
1997 when Rwanda went into the Congo to pursue the remnants of uh, of Inherahamwe and the militias that had uh, 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 unsuccessfully tried to wipe out uh, uh, a large section of Rwandans. Uh, people thought it was only for purposes of just making sure that they do not retaliate and come back. Fast forward today, you know, we are saying that peace that we pursued was for the peace sh should be replicated. The model should be replicated across other countries. Now, that said, we live in an extremely materialistic world. So uh, there has to be something in it for all of us. And uh, uh, whether that is written in the agreements that are published or whether it is not is a different story. But uh, it's very comforting as a Rwandan who lives in Rwanda to know that um, you know there's an army that can fight your wars and fight wars for other people. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Um <clears throat> I think it's interesting. Uh, it's a, it's an interesting uh, development, um, but more so. Um, I think when you look at uh, whether it's uh, the deployment in Mozambique or Central African Republic and link it to the peacekeeping uh, missions um, in different countries, I think they fit uh, directly into the country's uh, foreign policy, which has two main pillars. Uh, attainment and, and uh, maintenance of, of stability, peace and stability, not just uh, nationally by regional level and continental global level. Um, secondly, I think it also, in a pan-African way, I think it is good to see that uh, there's an African country that is trying to demystify some of these things. And the reason I say this is because um, for a very long time um, you would think, oh, the West has created an impression that it is the only one that has capabilities in terms of addressing uh, these threats. So as part of, I think, countering uh, Western or mainly American, um, I'm trying to think of the diplomatic word to put it. Mm -hmm. You're not a diplomat. <laughs> you will struggle with uh, it. Exactly. <laughs> the, you know, the hegemony of the, of the Western world. Um, the American military. Yes. Um, it's good to see that there's an African country that has such uh, aspirations. And... Back home, I think it is good that uh, we have uh, a military that is, that is active. Mm -hmm. um, just a few uh, weeks ago, we were talking among friends and we were saying, if you look at some countries, um, their military, you know, military officials have pot berries, mm. you know, mm. <laughs> and this is because they've been inactive. And you only see that when they are faced, you know, with riots and the situation is out of control, they deploy them and you can see they, they can't cope with, you know. So I think it's strategic uh, to, to have uh, a military that is active, um, not only in terms of uh, safeguarding national interests, but also uh, at continental level and hopefully at global level, uh, because it helps in terms of building capabilities. Um, capabilities um, beyond combat, but also in terms of uh, the emerging threats, ad addressing the emerging threats th that we see. Mm. So beyond, um, I wouldn't focus so much right now on the economic aspect of it, but on I think what is important, first of all, is that we have a military that is building capabilities in terms of dealing with not national, just national, but also regional and continental, you know, yeah. uh, threats. Because in the long term, 
uh, also it improves uh, the ranking of our military mm. uh, because I was looking at how um, they determine um, that you are a global kind of military power. Right now it's the U.S. And the U.S. is uh, a military power because it has capabilities across mm -hmm. land, sea, mm -hmm. um, even the airspace. Yes, Air Force. Yes, yes, you know. So if we can have a military that is able to deal with threats across, even better for us uh, in the long term. I think one of, I? The things, one of the things I find interesting also uh, when it comes to our uh, you know, foreign policy through the lens of, uh, of military deployment is that um, you know, there's pressure. We, we, we need to seek other ways of self-sustenance as a mm -hmm. country. And I find it really um, insightful, um, you know, the bilateral deals that are brokered between Rwanda and some of these other countries. You know, in 2019, there was a bilateral um, sort of agreement uh, in terms of economic cooperation and investment with Bangui. Uh, I think the same, um, I don't know the details, I don't think we, all, we do, but I'm sure the same is also with regards to uh, what's happening in Mozambique. So in as much as, as we're going in to, to not look at um, national, um, you know, sort of safety or threats to us as a country, we are also looking at it in a sort of Pan-African way. Uh, but also with this comes, you know, it opens avenues for, you know, trade uh, and investment between Rwanda and these other countries. And I find that very uh, interesting in terms of just looking at foreign policy and looking at this um, sort of trend, these avenues that are, that are opening up. Uh, secondly, for me, I also see that um, when you look at um, countries that, that go out of the countries to deal with threats in other countries, usually they're characterized by, you know, size, mm. population, um, the natural resources they have. And Rwanda is a small landlocked country, uh, but I think it speaks volumes for us uh, when our military um, is competent enough. Uh, for instance, what happened in Mozambique, we're not part of SADC, but you know, as, as the you know, SADC was, um, you know, was just in meetings, having meetings, um, to have meetings to deal with the situation that's been there for the last couple of years. Bilateral agreement between Rwanda and Mozambique. Rwanda, no time wasted, sent our troops there, dealt with the threat competently, appreciated by you know, the leadership in Mozambique. Uh, it shows me you don't have to have, you don't have to be a huge country. You don't have to have all this unlimited amount of resources to be able to go and contribute um, to peace and security in other countries. Um, so it, it just shows me something about how we are using our core strengths, you know, like our low hanging fruit to kind of, you know, uh, broker peace in regions um, other than ours, uh, in communities that we're not part of other than ours. Yeah. And I find that extremely um, inspiring, um, and I, I know we're not supposed to be, you know, tapping ourselves on the back. It's not, it's not in our culture, so to speak. But uh, when I look at um, our foreign policy with regards to peace and security in the region, this this angle uh, in recent years, I find it very admirable, uh, and I'm just, you know, looking forward to seeing what's more as a country we have in store when we when we tackle um, foreign policy. Yeah, Brandon, Honestly, yeah, but also oh, just oh, Charles wanted to say yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, oh. Charles. Uh, I think uh, the gentleman in me will allow Bana to go first. <laughs> and not just to say that, um, of course, there are risks, yeah? yeah. Um, there are risks uh, that come with uh, these uh, deployments. Um, and, of course, there are casualties. Uh, I think we, we, we've uh, had some of them, unfortunately. Uh, but it's the long-term uh, plan. Um, that I think the, the strategic positioning of, 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 of the country mm -hmm. that we, we have to think about. And also, again, if you go to Rwanda's foreign um, policy, the second pillar around wealth uh, creation, mm -hmm. the two go they hand are, in hand. Yes. 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 And we know that in absence of you know, peace and stability, you cannot talk about wealth creation or economic development. Absolutely. Yeah, so Absolutely. Yeah, within that light. Down. Charles? Yeah, the point I want to raise is really around the shift or the migration of our own, of our foreign diplo diplomacy and how we deployed uh, our leaders to represent Rwanda in, in different foreign missions. So for a while, uh, the, f the primary focus was on uh, commercial diplomacy mm -hmm. and where you'd uh, have uh, predominantly good sales people uh, representing the country wherever they were, and their primary objective was to bring deals, to bring investors, to bring 
uh, uh, foreign direct investment into the country. Whether that yielded fruit, definitely yes. Whether it could have been done better, definitely yes. Whether it was complete, probably, probably not. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward, we start deploying some of our best generals to head our foreign missions. Now, uh, I've said this several times on the square that one of the things I regret about, that I don't like about the Army is that they said I was too old too to join the Army. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the, the Ronan Army is extremely impressive. Tourist. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you have, it, it's a good thing in the sense that you have people who are growing old, but who have Beautiful. a lot of energy and, and, and whatever to serve. Mm. They, they, may, they may not be able to serve only in the army, but if they can lend their brains and energies and experience to the entire nation at large, even better. And then fast forward, you have uh, a few of these senior officers in the army, uh, and let's not even forget that for, for a while, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was led by a senior officer in the army. Mm. So, uh, and then if you look at the deployments today across different countries, you've had very many senior officers in the army mm -hmm. who have either left uh, foreign service or are still in foreign service. Mm -hmm. So, the, 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 if uh, 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 I'm to give an allusion of a, of a football academy, the best academy from which to recruit for foreign service is is the army and that's for for the purpose of saying uh, in my personal opinion that you're going to very very comfortably blend the military strategy military prowess that uh, Rwanda has proven but it also allows you to say that a man on the mission is 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 a, is a soldier with a sling on his shoulder mm -hmm. uh, that, 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 that has, has helped us. But also, at the same time, we have not forgotten that the commercial, and this way I think the blend comes in, that we, the, the government of Rwanda, I don't, I'm not too good at, at showering praises mm -hmm. on the square, mm -hmm. but in the, in the circumstances where they feel that certain missions are short of, of uh, the sales skills, they have uh, severely empowered um, uh, commercial attaches and commercial offices, trade offices, uh, even RDB itself, to make sure that at least th there's a very, very uh, good balance between strategic interests and commercial interests. That's really the point that I wanted to raise, that we did not forget the commercial diplomacy. Yes, military uh, diplomacy was, is and continues to be extremely important, but the blend the way it has come in without forgetting uh, uh, the previous has been a, 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 a fantastic mix. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Charles, I, I know you said this uh, several times. Um, and I'll not stop. No, no, no. About You're just upset that the, the military, you know, the army cannot recruit you. But I'm sure we can find ways for you to contribute uh, later on in life. I think <laughs> this is my contribution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Bernice, is there something you want to add before we go to our next topic? No, just to say that... Um, if anybody has observed uh, the military, for some reason, you know, most of them are, at least the ones I see, are really young people, um, quite uh, sophisticated mm -hmm. uh, young people. Young yeah, uh, is relative. No, seriously, young. Uh, yeah, like on really a level young. of captain, young. Yeah, yeah. Possibly even under. But you know, okay, that's what's in your young face. And <laughs> young and handsome. Young and handsome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, um, young uh, and very disciplined, and it's it's really. Refreshing to see. Yes, it's uh, it's, uh, it's but not at a strategic level. It's it's refreshing to mm. see, and uh, I haven't had the opportunity to interact with many of them. Uh, but again, if you look at the emerging uh, threats right now, um, I think we will have less of combat, but more of you know cyber wars. Um, so I would imagine that uh, most of these young people are you know, are quite um, advanced in terms of uh, one technology and being able to uh, 
uh, deal with some of these threats that, that we see. And you cannot just do that at national level. You need uh, not just regional, but also to uh, deal with, um, you need partners even globally to, to be able to build the capacity, the capability to, yes. to deal with some of these uh, emerging threats. So I see also uh, deployments contributing to that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, if you're talking about emerging threats uh, that are not necessarily physical threats, but, you know, mm. in, in, in the world, you know, the, the, the cyber domain, um, mm. I think really, um, I, I would like to believe that our, our military, um, you know, is at the forefront, um, has taken this into account and is, you know, is, is preparing accordingly. And yeah, training, that's why we see young and people. Equipping, yeah. um, it's, 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 you know, it's um, teams, it's, it's uh, staff um, adequately. Yeah. 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 Um, so we, we are, I just want us to read a couple of tweets that are based on um, um, uh, we are, that we are to do with the, the topic tonight. Uh, the first tweet coming in um, is from Viateur, who says that Rwanda uh, International Arena is doing so well. We wish our country uh, to keep it as we are striving for resilient economy as de developed countries despite some setbacks like COVID and vaccine iniquity. So that's Viateur with the, the first tweet basically saying that... Um, you know, internationally in the international arena, you know, it's it's doing well based, except for a couple of th uh, setbacks, uh, as he mentioned. The next part of um, our topic is to do with wasteful public expenditure. I know on the square, Charles and Berna, this is a topic we've covered <laughs> several times. We've had um, the, you know, the OAG on the show, the Auditor General on the show, Mr. Biraru Obadiah. Uh, we've talked about this a couple of times, but, you know, the Public Account Committee just uh, uh, earlier this month uh, started the scrutiny of uh, state finances, um, poor management of state finances in 85 public institutions and entities. Uh, so MPs and the Auditor General's office, uh, of course, expressed concern that the government has paid over Rwandan francs, uh, 2.9 billion Rwandan francs, uh, in commitment charges in different projects uh, that have not yet started or have started, but with a very low execution rate. Um, and I'll just read here, among some of the stalled projects um, to be executed uh, that have not um, been executed include the export targeted irrigation project, um, the Rwanda Innovation Fund, as well as the Rusizi 3 hydropower project. Lots of money here, uh, lots of taxpayers' uh, money as well, lots of fees and delays um, that government is, you know, doling out. And Bren, I'll start with you. Um, I know we're kind of repeating ourselves here, uh, but you know, this is what the viewers put for us to talk about tonight. Why, why do you think this keeps on happening? in your opinion, and what are some solutions, you know, to policy makers uh, who might be listening in on the show tonight? What are some of the reasons do you think this happens in, in your opinion, as well as what are some solutions that can be done to address this? It's a, it's a difficult one, uh, but one obvious thing is that the economy is growing. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's more to eat. Yes, there's more to eat, uh, you know. Uh, if the economy wasn't growing, if there was not enough, uh, you know, wealth being created, then there would not be, I would imagine, opportunities for, you know, for this kind of expenditure. Mm -hmm. So let's also look at that aspect that the economy is growing, there's a bit of wealth creation, and so there are, it's going to be inevitable that you will have some of these uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I feel that um, if you have, if anybody has followed uh, the reforms that have been happening uh, within government, um, there is, um, I think, over the last decade, uh, there's been a deliberate effort to strengthen public financial accounting uh, systems. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, uh, I think even what we see uh, in the Auditor General's report really comes from some of these systems that have been put in place, you know, so that when the Auditor General goes back and is doing his accounts, he's using, you know, these systems. So when we didn't have the systems, we didn't even know what, where the leakages were. Yeah, so we are making progress. At least we can detect some of these. Um, we can identify them. And what we have to do is to address them. Mm -hmm. But I want to speak to a different issue, which is um, a trend that you see, um, you know, with stalled projects most of the time. 
most people are scared to to take a risk, you know, to to be the ones to approve uh, whether it's a project or anything that lands on their table that was, for instance, not uh, initially planned for, or if there are changes. So on one hand, you have, you know, the stringent uh, measures, but at some point, I think they begin to become counterproductive mm -hmm. uh, because people are, officials are reluctant to take decisions because they don't want to be held to account, you know. Uh, so you, you see a bit of that mm -hmm. um, from the meetings, uh, the public accounts committee meetings. You'll have agencies blaming, you know, uh, it was not us, it was the other agency. And then, so you have this back and forth, you know, this, we, we got to know about this, we referred it to this agency because they are the ones that were supposed to give a response and they, we didn't get a response in time. And so you have this back and forth, you know, uh, the, the bureaucracy, that's number one, two, and also coordination, institutional uh, coordination, which is also uh, a song. Yes, on the square. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. Mm. Uh, but I think again, if you look at uh, the trend, when we see what is happening with technology, for instance, um, most uh, public services are. are are being uh, digitalized. Mm -hmm. That is part of addressing um, some of where these leakages could be. Because mm -hmm. uh, let us recall that the more paperwork, the more you're likely to have corruption. Mm -hmm. The less paperwork, you kind of at least minimize it. And what? And there's a trail, you know. Yes, yes. So the more, yeah, the the, the current uh, digital trend that we're seeing, uh, I think, gives hope that eventually, because you cannot be corruption free. You can, one, of course, be deliberate and say, and not encourage it, and also deal with it when it actually happens. But it is, uh, I think it would be unrealistic to think that we'll get to a point where we are corruption free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but when you look at the systems that are being in place, I think it gives hope that eventually we will see a reduction, but we are likely again to see another threat around emerging new trends of, you know, corruption. Mm. Earlier this year, last year, I think we were having this discussion around uh, how uh, corruption now is, is, is more sophisticated. Mm. Um, people will use complete strangers, you know, register property and, yeah. So it's, it's difficult. Um, it, it will be more challenging, uh, but if you look at the enforcement that has been happening over the last uh, couple of months, you see a deliberate uh, plan uh, to deal with some of these challenges, uh, hold people to account, because uh, if a project was is delayed um, by several years, I mean, the cost escalation, we can't afford it, especially with uh, what is happening with the economy, you know cost escalation uh, or we were talking about this uh, again with some if you look at uh, for instance the targets for affordable housing right now I doubt if there's any affordable housing project that is on track mm. Mm. why the media was called to signing of, of some of these finance uh, financing agreements or and now almost one year down the road, we, are, we see a gap because either some of the projects have stalled or the contractors have abandoned the project. And you can expect that the Aud uh, Auditor General's report will pick out you know, some of these cases. Irrigation projects, they keep coming up, you know, and the milk crisis that we have today, part of it is because irrigation has not taken off. Mm -hmm. Yet when you look at the government expenditure into putting in place irrigation systems, where are they not working? Where are they, you know? So it's, it's a challenge, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but hopefully along the way, we, we can find a way to address it. Charles? Yeah, uh, I'll say one thing very briefly, that it is very good that we keep talking about it, mm -hmm. that, uh, that we keep saying that the Auditor General is, is, is picking it on. In, in many other markets or economies, it, it just passes. 
but i but i also say that uh, the bigger problem is that we address the effect and not the cause and i will give you practical examples that um going by the example of why do irrigation projects Bernard was talking about irrigation projects why do irrigation projects go bad it's because our our system's biggest strength is not in carefully thinking about the project design the project implementation Rwanda's system's biggest strength is about punishing the people who did not do it right <laughs> so we we, we, we we will not go deep into knowing why it went wrong mm. we will be very quick in putting into prison the person who who did not see the project mm. come to life now the direct impact of that is first of all there is serious challenges around uh, uh, how we we are judged on rule of law and uh, how how our judicial system works because first of all the person who was in the in the position whilst whilst the project did not work will automatically be denied bail because a huge multi-million dollar project went wrong irrespective of who, the reasons for which it went wrong mm. so we have addressed the effect and not the cause time in time again now the the bigger problem that there is is around efficiency and that's what we are seeing today that people in positions of responsibility will see their predecessors and their colleagues get into serious trouble because the end result did not go well on time and they 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 remain impartial they remain passive and then um allow me to say this in kinyaranda that nacho nacho nachishije na nicho nish i know to imply i didn't do anything wrong oh, I, also didn't, right. I didn't also didn't do anything oh, yes, yeah yes. so but it goes uh, back to what brenna is talking yes, about, yes. about accountability yeah, yeah and, and, and the lack of accountability and, and taking yes you know, being in the driver's seat and saying i will be accountable for this but let something move forward yes you know so my uh, and uh, on the two three or more occasions that we have had the auditor general on the show today i mean uh, on here on the on, on, on the square we've actually tackled him uh, uh, around the methodology mm. and and that's where really the problem is he, uh, it's very easy when it comes to numbers to, to look at the loss but how did we arrive at that loss was it a loss because somebody did not make the right decision at the right time mm. it's very easy to attract donor money to do you're talking about uh, 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 affordable housing it's a topic that is very close to my heart and it, the judgment will be houses that are built that uh, people who cannot afford middle income housing are staying in but how do we get to 1000 houses you have to move people if the people refuse to be moved it's a bit of a problem so uh, uh where guess where we we sort of need to get back to the drawing board mm. is 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 uh to look at the cause to look at to look at uh, uh why is it that we have hundreds or tens excuse my hyperbole of uh, government officials languishing in prisons yet we are not solving the problem why is it that judgment in judgment out people are convicted yet we still having yet we are still having problems yes so is it that we have a very big corruption problem definitely not is it because we constantly have yes. people in, who are incompetent in charge and definitely not know, definitely not yes. so that is it's definitely because we are we are looking at the at at the at the end point mm. of the person who was in charge mm. when the project went wrong and I'll, I'll give you a practical example i've been uh, in uh, you know and, and banner please don't crucify me at the end of this show <laughs> before this show began Bana asked me if I'm into farming. 
<laughs> because she's been seeing, following me on social media and um, commenting about farming and, uh, and irrigation. I, I saw that, Charles. I, I found it very interesting. So I told Bana, I told Bana, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you do not have a farm, but the food that you eat is not grown in a restaurant. <laughs> so I'm in the real estate business and. Uh, food is grown on land mm -hmm. and she appreciated knowing that fact <laughs> but I, I visited an irrigation project somewhere in the eastern province and farm owners of the land had plugged out and disconnected the irrigation pipe so there is there is two ways of irrigating it either comes overhead or it comes mm -hmm. underneath your soil so because they were being forced to grow crops that were not putting food into their po into their tummies mm. they 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 messed up with a, it's called a drip system mm. they messed up with a drip system that was flowing water into their into their soil but the drip system is meant for high value crops now fast forward if that irrigation project goes wrong the head of rab or whoever is that will go will we will, will be likely. in trouble yeah we'll be in trouble but will it will it be his problem mm. definitely not right so uh, yes. absolutely your so, point of yes. looking at the root causes yes yes we, we need we, we need to relook into why our projects go wrong mm. the, the the multitude of projects you have you have mentioned diana is not because of incompetent officials mm. it's because from the conceptual phase mm. from the project execution phase du sorry during the project execution phase um, it's not been holistically thought of, mm. you know, we, 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 we there, there's an agriculture mechanization project and it's one of those that is causing a little bit of problems, uh, mm. uh, right now. Mm. And then the, 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 the tractors were taken to a place whose terrain was not conducive for tractors. Mm. Then you ask the, probably the guy who's, go, who's going uh, to, to, to face, the music, if he's not already, he or she's not already facing the music, is the person at the extreme end. So we, we, we need to seriously relook mm. at how we design and think about, about all these projects. And, and, and it, happens, it happens across uh, 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 all the different sectors. Um, no, but Charles, you're, you're absolutely yes. right on that. For me, I think, and I'm kind of, um, I'm, I'm kind of glad about the reporting in this project that, that goes on of late, um, the human cost to it. You know, we, we look at the semantics of, you know, the, the billions of dollars, the, the, the taxpayers' uh, money, the this, the that, but it's the human aspect that we need to really um, magnify. You know, for instance, the Rwanda Innovation Fund, a fund that was supposed to have been done in mm. by 20, uh, it hasn't even started um, as of, you know, 2020, and it's supposed to be done by, I think, 2022. Um, if you look at the human cost to it, these are, and if I'll just read here, um, it was forecast to create more than 2,000 direct and indirect jobs. Uh, sorry, 2,000 direct jobs, 600, six, 2,000 direct jobs and 6,000 indirect jobs um, over its 10-year cycle. Uh, this is something that was supposed to have kicked off, um, you know, uh, by now, but uh, it is stalled. And um, I, I, I just want to understand um, how, you know, like Charles, you're saying, you know, there's need to really rethink the design, uh, the conceptualization of these projects in a very holistic manner. You know, yeah. you're talking about the drip uh, irrigation system that's being sabotaged by farmers because they don't see the value. So when the project was being done, um, one tends to think that, you know, the ecosystem was probably not um, really thought through and you have issues like this happening. But the human cost, I think, is very, it's worth really looking into. And then also in terms of reporting and, you know, magnifying it, um, I think people need to understand the element of, you see, of how this project, yes. um, the, the cost on, 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 hum, on, the, uh, on livelihoods. You see, what, what ends up happening, because we do not th think through the entire ecosystem, we end up procuring very expensively or at the end of the project, mm -hmm. the project ends up being extremely expensive for us. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest uh, shortcomings of the government of Rwanda is around project management and uh, uh, cost analysis. So um, it, it's very easy for us to conceive an amazing idea like, for argument's sake, that we just set up uh, airport project or or uh, no, 
special economic zone or I'm, I'm just dropping it examples and then when or, or convention center and then when we fall into trouble then we say hey hang on a second is there a london farm or you know an international farm that can help us come and rescue the project and look at it from a cost benefit analysis look at it from where we went wrong in the conceptual phase and in the execution phase and as a growing economy you can easily be hoodwinked by 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 Chinese contractors who come and tell you we will build it, we'll finance it, and we'll hand it to you when it is complete. Thank you. Bro. Yes. Yet it is at your cost. In the event that you don't remember that it is at your cost, and you're very quick because you know you're not out of pocket at the inception phase of the project, you will jump onto that deal. If anything goes wrong along the way you'll remember that you should have thought of a competent project manager from the onset. So our project management skills, our project, our, our holistic Can be project improved. delivery uh, uh, skills, uh, skills uh, 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 are still lacking. I think the, the last time I checked, there was uh, a unit created at uh, the Ministry of Finance that is actually supposed to monitor uh, implementation of, of, of projects. I don't know what has happened since then, but I know uh, part of the reason why that unit was created was to actually look into this issue of uh, uh, wasteful expenditure. But to your point, the examples are many. Uh, it even gets to how quickly we sign uh, some of these agreements, you know. Even but I would like to think know, around that does it due diligence. I mean, it's... Um, we do our due diligence to I the extent of getting clean money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you, I, I think, if you I look think, at... Um, no, no, you, I think we really do uh, go big with so it due diligence. So it's, it's not to say... It's, it's not to say that uh, there's no due diligence that mm. is going on, mm. yeah? It is there, but it is not enough, yeah? That's one. Uh, two, if we had the Minister of Justice here to tell you how many cases he's dealing with mm. involving government contracts, mm. you'd be shocked, mm. you know. Yeah, the the prosecution shocked. of the crime has been happening. You know, um, school, um, you'd be shocked by the numbers related to, uh, you know, litigation. investors, yes, yes, yes litigation, yes. you know, mm. investors uh, suing the government. Mm. Oh, I thought you were going to actually you know. talk about um, in terms of prosecution of the crime when it comes to... No, 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 no. Oh, you're, you're on the other yeah, spectrum. Yeah, litigation, yeah, okay. litigation, okay. you know. Yeah. We have many of those uh, simply because someone didn't do their job in terms of reading the contract mm. and making sure that some of these... And it's getting better, though. At the beginning, um, you can understand that um, we also have uh, mercenaries that will target emerging economies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, like you know, yeah. You have mercenaries around the world that will target uh, emerging economies, bring you a sophisticated contract that you, you can't even read. Yeah? But I think uh, there's been a deliberate effort even to build capacity in terms of that. Um, you know. So I hope eventually we'll have minimal uh, litigation uh, related to investment. Mm. But we, we're still paying for some of, some of these bad decisions. Mm. Mm. Uh, a good example is to just look at the Convention Center. Before we went for the Eurobond, the series of contractual issues that we had, you know, uh, before the Convention Center was uh, completed, I'm sure the, we haven't finished paying that debt. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so we must not forget that we live with some of these costs. And at the end of the day, it is you and me and our children that will be able to We'll have to pay for, for some of these costs. But you're talking so, about before the convention center went through the euro bond. Yes, yes. yes. So before prior, we got that money. Yes, yeah. Yes, In fact, part of the money that was uh, the euro bond money mm. went to directly service what was very expensive, mm. you know, an expensive mm. uh, loan. So you want you don't want to do that. You actually want to uh, borrow money and and invest it mm. and not use so much of it to pay off, mm. you know. Mm. Uh, anyway, that's uh, another issue. Mm. Uh, but I feel that over the last decade, uh, we've had so much uh, in terms of learning and improving the system. 
So some of the grave errors that we had uh, in 10 years ago hopefully will not happen again. We have more capacity here. Yeah. But we cannot continue with the trend. No, it can't. We cannot keep on having an upward tra trajectory when it comes to wasteful expenditure. We can't. I mean, yeah. you, we can't you, afford you look it. at, you know, with the pandemic. We uh, can't afford it. With the pandemic, the difficulties that we have had, you just can't. You know, mm. so I'm, I'm sure the economic intelligence units mm. will be I agree. working overnight. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like Charles said, um, we will keep on talking about it. We will keep on talking about, you know, public um, expenditure, losses, wasteful expenditure, and, and that sort of thing. On the I show. just want to, 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 to say one more thing before you move on to your next topic. Yeah. And that's around the role of the Auditor General and probably combined with the Rwanda Governance Board, is that. Uh, uh, as, as Rwanda grows, as, 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 as we strive to improve uh, the way we, we manage our meager resources, mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things that, uh, that, that we need to look at, and whether it's a public accounts committee, whether it's an auditor general's office, whether it's Rwanda governance board, is to ensure that we, we move away from a culture of blaming and a culture of improvement because sometimes if you're to look at it legally from a legal perspective mm. it's very easy for a person who is in a position of responsibility to get away with this mm. and we, we, we get it wrong by saying that the indicator of causing financial loss is because we locked up mm. so and so no mm. We need to get to the cause, and that's at the risk of repeating myself. Yeah, okay. Whether it is Auditor General's office or Rwanda Governance Board or Prime Minister's office or whoever cares to listen, let's get down to the rock bottom. Is why do we negotiate poorly? Mm. Why and 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 Bernard raised something in in passing. I know RDB for a fact has uh, has done a fantastic job in terms of recruiting amazing people in in the negotiation department. Uh, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, they need to be empowered further. They need to, 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 the, to, to me today, I think they are doing a lot more firefighting uh, uh, because they have inherited a bad book. Mm. Uh, but moving forward, it's something that we really need to, 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 to make smoother. Um, the last topic for tonight uh, came from also, uh, you know, one of the views uh, in terms of historic preservation of infrastructure. And, um, you know, Charles and Brenna, and, and we'll be, you know, as quick as you can on this based on the time that we have still um, allotted to us. Um, uh, so this, this viewer said that over construction may, may prevent Rwandans, uh, guests, or even our future generations from really appreciating some of the scenic views as well as some of our unique historical uh, infrastructure. So my question to you, and I'll start off with you, Brenna, do you think there's a need to officially demarcate some of these areas, you know, buildings that have unique history mm -hmm. or areas that are visually, aesthetically, visually, you know, appealing, um, the views, you know, we are mm -hmm. su there's such a construction boom in the country. Charles, you know, you're in this business. Um, are we at risk of not preserving some, some really amazing and unique um, historical infrastructure? Brenna, I'll, I'll kick off with you before I head over to Charles. You know, when I, I, I looked at the notes, I wasn't sure why that is subject to debate. Mm. I thought it's common knowledge mm -hmm. that we should be <laughs> preserving. <laughs> yes, we should be preserving. Um, because if we, do, we, 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 we lose sense of, of, of our history, then I, I, I can't find any other reason. Yeah. But you know, there are cases whereby there's some sort of historical landmarks that have been overtaken with urban development. Yeah, but... So it's, the question this viewer put forward is, you know, are we at risk of, of just becoming... Forgetting our history. Yeah, yeah. Or, or pre preserving some memorial sort of landmarks, so to speak. I think if there's anybody and uh, <laughs> having a real estate dealer <laughs> on the show, yes. <laughs> I think this is a point of contention, but um, I don't think it should be subject to debate. Mm. I, I don't think so. Um, Whatever the you know the the billions are, uh, I don't think that we should have a debate around do we conserve you know uh, preserve our history or do we let the investor come and and, and put up a new building you know 
and and it's 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 an ongoing uh, global discussion uh, because in some cities mm. uh, you look around and it's just buildings you shiny know shiny glass yes you know and for me that's uh, you know it's quite depressing mm. um, it's technology, it has advanced, we can't help it. Uh, Charlie, we're talking about uh, the limited access to land, so you will need the higher... Sort of vertical construction. Yes, yes. Uh, but we must be deliberate and protect our history. Mm. Um, and, and, and most of it is also actually linked to our environment. Mm. Uh, because the more you have, you know, these high rises, the more you have... Um, these investments, mm. there's a cost to it in mm. terms of the environment. I agree. Yeah. Charles? I think there is, um, I'm almost uh, <laughs> It's a difficult one. I'm almost I know. <laughs> a bit conflicted. Because I think there's been a bit of a balance. I am hoping that this Nefsat hunt is not demolished and it is kept around I mean, what it looks. That's what I was thinking of. Yes. Yeah. yes. So this Nefsat hunt, even though it's a prison, mm. It was a prison. You can you, you, you can live the outside. You know, we go to Mombasa up to today and you look out for Jesus and it's a tourist attraction out there. Yeah. We have Stone the Richard House. Yes, Stone House. Mm. We have the Richard Bar. Count Museum yeah. down there and what have you. I have been to Cartier Mateus. I can't spend two months without, no, one month without going to Cartier Mateus and Cartier Commercial. Mm. I have seen that there are some of the old Arabic buildings that have that still remain. And these probably are buildings of the 1920s, 1930s. They have not yet been touched. I am hoping that they will remain and they blend with the new arcades that are coming up. I'll give the municipality uh, a benefit, benefit of doubt. Of doubt yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope that it remains. Yeah. I was a little bit disappointed that Sonara was brought down. It was the only mm -hmm. remaining whatever. Yeah, and the building. Yeah, yeah, but I I want to give the city a benefit of doubt that it will remain with a bit of character. Yeah, I know. And, and, not yeah. just shiny and, new, and, uh, not shiny plastic new. looking. Yeah. Ugly migongo glass, some of them <laughs> that are coming up. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, I want to read a market. tweet uh, that's just coming in from one of our viewers. If you could have this on our screen. Uh, this tweet is from Sandrine and she says that um, Charles Haber made a point and he articulated it in the, in the crystal clearest terms. Whether big or small the project might be, technical planning far before impl implementation with holistic um, SWOT analysis seems to skip the attention. It is a weakness on all parts um, of the world. Um, Sandrine, thank you very much for sharing your tweets. Mm -hmm. uh, keep the conversation going using hashtag the square RW. Uh, thank you very much for giving us the content that we have tonight to discuss, dissect, and give solution-oriented viewpoints, as we do every last Wednesday of the month on Viewers Edition. Uh, Brenna Namata, great to have you on the show. It's been a pleasure as always. Charlie, great to have you on the show. It's been a pleasure as always. Bring that here to you next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, to our partners, Uzi Collections and Bourbon Coffee, thank you for always supporting The Square. Have a good night. See you again next week.